Good afternoon, good afternoon. The, um, the talk after, after lunch is always uh, somewhat challenging, both for the speaker and for the, uh, for the audience. So we're gonna try to make the, uh, the best of it. I'm going to talk a bit about culture and the power of culture and how, culture, an, an, how an understanding of culture could help us be better software developers and better architects. My name is Avraham Pupko. Uh, for the last several decades, I have been a, a software architect designing large systems and working with people to get together in organizations to design the large systems. I currently work for a company in Tel Aviv called Toga Networks, and we design the future data center. These are data centers that are going to be smarter, better, faster, cheaper, all the um, things that we hope to find uh, from a data center. And I am uh, one of the architects. And um, I share uh, David Snowden's uh, aversion from the word artificial intelligence, and I like more some, something like machine learning or deep learning. Uh, I don't know if real intelligence exists, but artificial intelligence uh, certainly doesn't exist. And um, over time, I have become more and more interested in learning how do people join to create that magic thing called software. It's a topic that fascinates me. It's a topic I like learning a lot about. It's a topic I like teaching about and writing about. And I would like to share with you today some of what I have learned or what I have thought about in this, uh, in this area. This is a picture of a team of uh, Amish people in uh, Amish, Pennsylvania, Dutch, Dutch, Pennsylvania, going through a ritual ceremony called barn raising, and the people get together, they're about, they're, it's pretty much pushing the limits of the Dunbar number, there are about 150 people working on this team, and the team is a very, very focused team, they understand exactly what the end product looks like, they, each person understands her or his role within the uh, community that is raising this barn. Um, if you've ever seen one of these on TV or in, or in media or in the movies, uh, the movie Witness has a very nice scene of barn raising, it's always accompanied with a very strong sense of fulfillment, of fun, of doing something, of accomplishing together. The music is always very upbeat, the lighting, it's, you see that the people are actually very much enjoying what they are doing. And some of these teams that are barn raising teams are actually teams that are hundreds of years old. These teams have been, they're family teams, they, there's a lot of family ties between the individuals on the teams, and people get old and they die and then new people come in and learn the trade and come in. It's, it, it's a very, it's a, the Pac-Man rule on long-term, extreme long-term. So people step out of the Pac-Man because it's time for them to move on. And new people come into the building, to the teams, to the barn raising teams. They start from a very, very young age, uh, doing all the age appropriate activities. And we could learn a lot from this about the joy in building something together, about the fulfillment that we find in building something together. And what I'm going to do today inspired by that, is talk about a few things. I'm gonna talk about complexity, and it's always a challenge for me to talk about complexity with David Snowden in the room. It's always an honor, and uh, so thank you, David Snowden, for your comments this morning, Professor Snowden. I wanna talk about complexity, talk about trust, talk about culture, and time permitting, I would like to apply it all to software development. So let's first talk about complexity. Now, human beings are the only species that we are aware of that is capable of doing really, really complex things. We know how to build airlines and airports. We know how to build particle colliders. We know how to put a man on the moon. We know how to build the internet. We know how to build a pyramid. These are all extremely complex tasks that require many people to cooperate and require a lot of, a lot of stuff to happen in order for them to come right. And no other living being that we know is capable of doing anything near in complexity to what humans are capable. And if we ask ourselves, what can we attribute this to? What allows us to do these very difficult and very complex things? Uh, so the first thing that comes to mind is nothing beyond the triv trivial is done by a single person. They're all done by groups of people. Now, this is not because we are stronger than any other species. We are certainly not more adapted to our environment or faster or taller. We are not any of those. Even the opposing thumbs that we have that allow us to manipulate tools in all kinds of interesting ways does not really explain how we are able to do all these complicated things. The reason we're able to do complicated things has to do with our ability to function as a team. And I wanna talk about three gifts. They're not the only three gifts that human have, ha humans have, but they are three of the important gifts. We have the gift of motivation, imagination, and cooperation. Many others, but those are the ones I'm going to talk about 
today. We're going to talk about motivation, imagination, and cooperation. Motivation. We want to do amazing things. We want to do great things. Now, animals also have motivation. Their motivation is to eat, to procreate, and to not be eaten. Those are the main motivations of an animal. Yeah, maybe they have other territorial ambitions or other power ambitions, but their lives are directed by the primary motivations of having another, they are genetically programmed and conditioned to have another generation of species. Human beings have motivation that goes way beyond that. In the words of John F. Kennedy, the president who uh, was president at the time that uh, NASA started its mission to uh, send the human to the moon, sometimes called send the man to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade. I don't know how to do the Boston accent, forgive me. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do those other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, or as he says, hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone. We want to do it because it's hard. That is a unique human trait. We want to do things because they're hard. We find meaning, we find satisfaction in challenging ourselves. The, uh, anybody that has children in school that struggle with homework, we know that the homework, the good homework is homework that is always beyond the capability of the child. If the homework is within the capability of the child, she gets bored. If the homework is beyond the capability of the child, not too beyond, but a little beyond, then the child will challenge herself and do the homework and she will feel invigorated. She'll feel challenged. She has this motivation. The next thing we have is imagination. We have a very, very elaborate imagination. We are capable of imagining things and how we will organize to make those things and what the world would be like. And our languages have very elaborate words for our imagination. We have very useful words like could and should and would. And perhaps these are words that describe worlds that don't exist. Whenever I say something should happen, I'm saying it doesn't happen now, but it could exist and it should exist and if we do things right, it maybe will exist. Those are imagination words. Now, animals also have imagination. An animal's imagination might be limited to what will the world be like if I get eaten by the predator, let's run away. Or what will the world be like if I successfully mate, let's find a mate. But that's probably the limit of it and that's why the language is uh, appropriately limited. We'll talk about that a bit more. So we, we actually saw this picture earlier today, and this is a story about imagination. It's from Genesis. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heaven. This is primarily a story about cooperation and about language, but the opening verses are a story about imagination. We're going to do something magnificent. Why? The world wasn't overpopulated at the time. They didn't need skyscrapers. They wanted to build them tall because they wanted to build them tall. It was a motivational story. And they had the imagination to imagine we need to build raw materials. We don't have enough materials, we'll make materials. We'll organize ourselves in order uh, to do it. It's interesting actually to look at the history of skyscrapers. Skyscrapers do not follow Moore's law, Moore's trajectory at all. So uh, about uh, 4,000 years ago, the Pyramid of Giza was built 147 meters tall. It held that record for almost 4,000 years. And then 4,000 years later, we were able to add 13 meters to the tallest building. The Lincoln Cathedral is 160 meters. It held that record for another 500 years and added nine meters again, Washington Monument, Eiffel Tower, it was a big, big jump, it was 170 meters, 171 meters, and then the Burj Khalifa Tower, uh, I think it's in Dubai, is 830 meters almost, and I think as of now it is still the tallest building in the world. It took us 5,000 years to grow five-fold. That is not Moore's law, but the reason, building, building, building upwards, build, building elevation is an extremely challenging, um, is an extremely challenging task engineering task, and we are able to do that. We are able to do that because we have motivation and imagination. We first imagine a building, imagine how we're gonna do it, and then we do it. And last, we have cooperation. And by cooperation, 
We're able to work together. We're able to motivate each other. We're able to ins- we are able to inspire each other with our motivation and then cooperate together because nothing trivial is, is ever done alone. All complex things are done with large groups of people or some groups of people that cooperate and do it together. And cooperation includes many elements, but among other things, it includes communication. We have to share a vision. We have to share how we're going to organize ourselves. We have to organize ourselves in a cooperative manner. Flash mobs are lots of fun, but you cannot do real complex things with a flash mob. We need to organize ourselves. We need to synchronize ourselves. We have words in our language for synchronization. We have very useful words like now, later, tomorrow, beforehand, afterwards. These are words that allow us to synchronize our actions with each other. By the way, these are all, these are all very highly contextual words. The word tomorrow or later or in a minute don't mean anything out of context. They get all their meaning from context and human beings are very, very context rich beings, our, our, cogn- our cognition, our minds are, con- are contextual. And we know how to trust each other. And we're going to talk a bit later about trust and why it is so important for uh, cooperation, coordination, and doing amazing things together. And um, ultimately, we will discuss about how culture impacts our ability to trust each other and how we can work together. So the simple a flow chart or the simple diagram often says that cooperation depends on understanding. We can't cooperate unless we have some platform of shared understanding. And we can't shared understanding unless we have some platform for communication. And we can't communicate unless we have language, because language is the most effective form of communication that we know. While true, this is a gross oversimplification of things. And I'm going to show a few more slides to try to expand on this and elaborate it. It'll still be oversimplified, but a little less. So when you talk about understanding, of course, you mean shared understanding. We have to have a joint understanding. And language, of course, means shared language. Now, it doesn't have to be perfectly shared, but there has to be enough of a shared vocabulary, enough of a shared syntax and shared grammar that we are able to cooperate. And shared understanding means a few things. It means a shared model, what we are going to do. It means a shared intention, why we are going to do this. We really should agree on the why. If I'm driven by one intent and you're driven by another, we might not be able to uh, understand. We need a sense of shared timing. We have to do it today, tomorrow. If I understand that we're going to do it today and you think we're going to do it in the next millennia, that is probably not a useful platform for um, shared understanding. We don't need shared motivation. We need aligned motivation. By aligned motivation, it means that my interests and your interests are not the same interests, but they are in line with each other. Free markets do not depend on shared motivation. They depend on aligned motivation. Aligned motivation means I want the services or goods more than I want my money. You want my money more than you want the services or goods that you have to uh, to to offer, we trade. We trade, we are both motivated to do a trade. I'm motivated to do a trade because I need the services. You're motivated to do the trade because you need the money. We have aligned motivation, we are able to cooperate. And when we do a large organization, some people are in it for the fun, some people are in it for the money, some people have a family to feed, some people have a bill to pay, some people want to put themselves through college, some people want to go on a vacation, that's all fine. I don't need everybody to want the same thing, I actually don't want it but I'm able to align through the wonderful invention of money, we are able to align their motivations, so an abstract in some sense, everybody wants to get paid, that's an abstraction of everybody wants the freedom to do whatever it is they want, and by that wonderful invention of money, they're able to cooperate and they're able to align in some sense their motivations. Shared language means shared vocabulary, shared grammar. We need shared words and we need those words to be assembled in language along the same meaning. By shared communication, we need shared context. Words like time, like time words, like now, later, um, never, don't mean anything out of context. And we need shared abstractions and shared metaphor. Every language has abstractions and metaphors. We take the abstractions and metaphors mostly from our culture or from people around us, but we always use abstractions and metaphors. They like if I say a sentence like, we always use abstractions and metaphors. That's not true. I sometimes am not talking. When I'm sleeping, I'm not using abstractions and metaphors. Or when I'm eating lunch, maybe I'm not using abstractions and metaphors. But you get it. When I say a word like, we always use abstractions and metaphors, 
It means almost always, or always when it's appropriate to use an abstraction or a metaphor, that's when we use it. And without abstractions and metaphors, we really cannot communicate effectively. And the reason is because abstractions and metaphors allow us to communicate in a very, very effective manner. If I had to spell out everything every time I spoke and say, whenever I am talking about language, I sometimes use an abstraction or a metaphor explaining what it is or why it's appropriate, that is not compressed enough, and we need to speak in compressed language in order to be effective in our use of language. Uh, maybe this goes back to the discussion that we had before about cognitive uh, overload. We, it, abstractions actually help us reduce our cognitive overload because we're able to speak in ideas that are familiar and ideas that are more uh, compressed. And all this depends on trust. And I'm going to talk about the, the there's, a feed, there's a feedback loop where shared language enables cooperation. If I don't have a shared language, I can't cooperate. But it's very highly cyclical or highly iterative, meaning if I have a shared language, I could cooperate. And if I cooperate, I am able to develop a shared language. Shared language emerges from cooperation. So sometimes it's over, uh, when we talk about ubiquitous language, perhaps in the DDD community, we might say things like, people will cooperate if they have a shared language. Certainly true. But the opposite of it is also true. People that cooperate develop a shared language. The shared language emerges. They start using the same words to mean the same things over time. And this is iterative. So they invent language so that they can cooperate. As they cooperate, the language is refined and evolves and adapts. And this is, again, cyclical or iterative. And this all requires a high degree of trust. People that do not trust each other, do not communicate well, do not cooperate well, do not coordinate well, and do not communicate well, and trust depends on culture. And we're going to try to explain what trust is, why trust depends on culture, and maybe we could do something about it or do something within that framework. So that's it. So, so far, we discussed complexity. We said that this complexity depends on communication very heavily, and communication dis depends to a high degree, to a very large degree, on trust. So what is trust? It's not easy to define. I'm going to attempt to provide perhaps examples, because that's what we do when we can't define things precisely. We will actually bring examples. It's actually a unique human activity. When talking with a compiler, you cannot define something by bringing examples. You have to be precise. But when talking to a human being, I could say, I don't know how to define it exactly, but I'll give you some examples, and you'll be able to gain an intuitive sense over time of what the word means. So that's what we're going to do with the word trust. When I say trust, I claim that I know and I understand, and maybe there's another word here, like I know and understand and sympathize or empathize with your expectations, beliefs, thoughts, fears, hopes, motivations, worldview, and moral sense of fairness. And I'll bring by way of example. One of the first examples, one of the primordial examples of cooperation comes from one of our ancestors many, many thousands or millions of years ago. Uh, humans started exi exhibiting a very unique human kind of behavior by which one human pulls down a branch and holds it down, and then the other human goes and picks the fruit off the tree that she couldn't reach before because it was too, it was too tall. So the, the first human pulls the branch down, the other human pulls the fruit and puts them in a basket, and then the human share the fruit that has been picked. That is considered a very early example of cooperation. Animals do not exhibit that behavior at all, ever. At least that's what I read. I don't know, but uh, what I read in the science books is that is a uniquely human kind of behavior, where one pulls the, uh, the branch and the other picks the fruit, and then they share the fruit. And then maybe they switch roles or not. Maybe they specialize. He becomes really, really good at holding the branch. She becomes really good at picking the fruit, and there's specialization that evolves. And in order for this to work, we have to, first of all, understand each other's expectations. We have to understand, I'm going to hold the branch. I expect that you will pick the fruit. I expect that we will share the fruit. If we do not have that shared expectation, we can't cooperate. I believe that picking fruit and cooperating on picking fruit is a worthwhile endeavor. I believe it's a good thing to do. It's a useful thing to do. It's a rewarding thing to do. And I, not only do I believe it, I believe that you believe it. And if I don't believe it, or I don't believe that you believe it, then we will not cooperate on that. We will not be able to cooperate it. And I understand your thinking process. Maybe your thinking process is, you don't trust me. Maybe you think 
I'm going to steal all the fruit. And I don't trust you because you're just going to pick all the fruit and run away. So we have to understand each other and communicate and come to some sort of contractual agreement or some sort of understanding of how we're going to do it. And I understand your fear. Your fear is that I'm going to pick all the fruit and run away. And I'm going to do what it takes in order to calm that fear down so that we can cooperate. I can't cooperate if I don't understand your fears and I don't address your fears and your hopes. My hope is that you're going to show fairness, that you're going to show understanding, that this joint effort is actually going to be better for both of us. And I have to understand your motivation. I, as a human being, like eating fruit. I imagine that since you look like me and behave like me, you probably also like eating fruit, especially if you told me as much. And we share a motivation and we are willing to work hard in order to cooperate that. We are willing to take a certain risk. And the risk is I might spend the next 20 minutes holding down the branch and you will pick all the fruit and then run away. And um, I have a certain shared feeling of morality, of fairness, of, co of, of, recipro of reciprocatory fairness. And I believe deeply that you share that sense of fairness, that you're not going to take advantage of me. Now, it didn't evolve in one day. I took risks. The first day I tried it, I only held the, the branch for a few moments. And actually, my trust was rewarded. I took a risk. You could have run away with the fruit, but you didn't. You, you lived up to the expectation and you shared the fruit with me. So tomorrow we'll do it for longer. Tomorrow we will do it in a more elaborate scheme. Maybe we'll bring other people into this circle of trust. And, I, we, and all these together might somehow exemplify or typify what it means to be trusting of uh, one another. And this goes along with a thing called theory of mind. Theory of mind means the good teachers have a theory of mind or the good are the good speakers or the good people that work together. A high EQ is a sign of a theory of mind. And a good theory of mind means I know what you're thinking and I know how you are perceiving the world even though you, through your different experiences or through your different shoes or through your different perspectives. And like if you're teaching a bunch of school children and you show, if you're a teacher, a math teacher, an arithmetic teacher, and you show long equation and the child doesn't understand it and you tell them what's so difficult to understand, it's really simple. You just do this, that, and the other thing and you get the result. That shows a low theory of mind. You're not able to observe the world through the eyes of another human being that does not have the same knowledge, experience, or perspectives that you have. And theory of mind, a rich theory of mind, is one of the elements needed in order to build trust. Why is theory of mind needed in order to build trust? Because people that believe that they are understood are willing to take risks. If he understands me, then he shares my values, he shares my beliefs, and maybe we could cooperate on something. If I talk and I'm not understood, I don't trust you because if you don't understand my argument or you don't understand my thought process or you don't understand my values, you probably don't understand a lot of other things about you and I'd be much, much more risk, risk averse and a lot less trusting. So theory of mind enables trust. It's very important for trust. And trust has to be built. Trust has to be maintained. Trust never happens on its own. It, it doesn't have to be deliberate. It happens from playing together and working together and being together, but it has to be built and maintained. And I take some inspiration from the second law of thermodynamics, which says that the heat always flows from the hot system to the cold system, or that the entropy always increases unless you invest external energy or in the vernacular sometimes it's expressed as, as it is much easier to make an omelet out of an egg than it is to make an egg out of an omelet. Now all of us have done both. We know how to make an omelet out of the egg. Perhaps some of us did it for breakfast. How do you make an omelet into an egg. How do you make an egg out of an omelet? You eat the omelet, you go to work, you earn your money, you go to the grocery store and you buy an egg. But that is a very, very long and labor intensive process, but it is still simpler than going to a laboratory and taking the omelet and doing it back into an egg. That is something very energy intensive. We, we actually do not know how to do it. We do not know how to make an omelet out of an egg. And it has to do, of course, with structure and chaos. Eggs are highly, highly structured material or things. They, they carry the potential of life within them. Omelets are highly disorganized. Actually, what the heat does is it breaks down many of the connections within the, uh, within the egg. So um, that's it about the second law of thermodynamics. And an important thing to recognize is that organizations are not people. I read this for the first time in an article by Kurtz and Snowden called something like elements of strategy, managing complexity, and something 
Uh, man do you remember the name of the article? I'm sorry. New Dynamics of Strategy. New Dynamics of Strategy. It was published in IBM Systems Journal maybe 20 some years ago. And what, what it says in this article was that, and this is a very important statement, I took a lot of inspirations, organizations, organizations are not capable of choice, order, or intent. But they are capable of giving the illusion of choice, order, or intent. Choice, order, and intent are human activities. Human beings, by choice I mean rational choice. Irrational choice maybe, maybe organizations are capable of. But directed choice, motivated choice, choice that has that to fill a rational objective and choice that is the best or optimal choice. It's a, it's a worthwhile reading, it's available as a PDF online. Organizations, even though they sometimes provide the illusion of having choice, order, or intent, and more so, because of our natural tendency to anthropomorphize, we like believing that the organization has choice, order, or intent. And we use statements like, the, organi the organization treated me unfairly. The organization was not right to me. The organization lied to me. Organizations don't lie. They don't treat you unfairly. People lie and treat you unfairly. A derivative of this uh, insight is that organizations do not have trust. Organizations have contracts, organizations have laws, organizations have regulations, but they never have trust. They never have trust beyond the trust of the people within the organization. So if we want to build a trusting organization, and by trusting organization I mean I trust the organization and the organization trusts me, the only way to do it is to build a trusting relationship with the people within the organization. I want the people around me, the people who I interact with, the people who I cooperate with, I want them to trust me and I want to trust them. I cannot build trust with an organization because organizations are not capable of choice, order, or intent. And how do you create uh, trust? Many, many ways to create trust, I'll discuss some of them. First of all, you take a risk. Every trust is you take risk. Now, it's easier to build trust the first time than it is to rebuild trust once it has been broken. So if you violated trust, if you, two people, strangers meet, they know, especially if they're from the same culture, they're able to build trust and work together. If one of them violates that trust and the more trusting people are of each other, the more the violation hurts, Re rebuilding the trust is much harder. And if you've broken the trust two or three times, you might never ever be able to rebuild it again. The trust might have been lost forever. Be aware of. How do we build trust? We experiment, we take risks. Our risks are rewarded, we'll take more risks. Our risks are not rewarded, we'll just move on to another relationship or another person or another type of engagement. There are reputation mechanisms in place. All the gossip, all the way people talk about each other and relate to each other, help enforce trust. So if I ever picked the fruit and then ran away, so you won't trust me anymore, but not only will you not trust me anymore, you will gossip about me and other people will stop trusting me also. And I'm aware of that. I understand how the gossip mechanisms work and that's why I will make sure to share the fruit with you and be fair. Trust is, again, through communication. We talk, we share ideas. Through evaluation, every time I invest in a reciprocatory uh, transaction or engagement, and it is rewarded, I think about it. And I said, oh, this person didn't have to, but they did something trustworthy. And then slowly over time, I gain experience, and familiarity breeds trust. Familiarity breeds trust, meaning that the more an experience is common, the more we've done stuff together, the more we are able to build trust. Now, that balance between the familiar and the unfamiliar is somewhat like the balance between the structured and the chaotic. So children, they are operating in two, in two domains or in two, along two sides of the spectrum. On the one hand, children like being close to mommy. Mommy represents the familiar, or daddy. They represent the familiar, represent the comfort, represent the stability in the world. On the other hand, the child wants to explore and try new things and experience new things and learn about the world through exploration. And, but if it gets too far or too much away, then they'll go back to mommy because that's the familiar. And slowly through that transition between the familiar and the, other, and the unfamiliar, they're able to broaden their horizons. So if you bring your child to a friend's house that the child has never been before, and the child is a little clingy because they want to stick to the familiar, that is good. That's how you show them, I will be here. You could explore a little, come back, and I'll be here again. Explore a little more, come back, I will be here again. If you bring your child to a friend's house, and then he goes to explore something, and you disappear, 
you might have lost some trust. The child knows that if he looks away, he, you, will, uh, you will disappear. A, um, a common children's game for, for very little children is the game of peekaboo. And peekaboo, the premise behind the game of peekaboo is if I can't see you, you can't see me. That is considered a low kind of uh, theory of, of mind because it's a naive uh, worldview. If I can't see you, you can't see me. As adults, we know that it's very possible that I can't see you because my eyes are covered, but you can see me. And then it evolves into the game of hide and seek. And hide and seek operates under the premise that I can see you, but you can't see me because I'm hiding. But I trust that you will look for me, that the worst thing that could, you could do in a game of hide and seek is just give up and go home. You're supposed to be engaged in the, uh, in the game. And trust is very, very much a resource. I would even say it's one of the most important resources, maybe even the most important resource. Communities or cultures or countries that are rich on trust do well, do very, very well. So if we think about a country like Venezuela, Venezuela is very, very rich on natural resources. They have iron and they have raw uh, fossil fuels and they have all kinds of ores and all kinds of minerals and they are a poor country. And the reason that they are a poor country is because the transactional costs are so high because people do not trust each other. There's a great deal of corruption. There's a great deal of manipulation of the system. So, so much effort goes into, and violence, goes into enforcing contracts that you can't invest your creative energy in, in bringing out the rewards that, the, that your very wealthy environment or country offers you. On the other hand, there are countries that are very poor in natural resources, perhaps countries like Singapore or Japan, that do very, very well. And the reason that they do very well is because there's a lot of trust between the people. So the transactional costs are relatively low. People are able to work together without investing a great deal of energy or resource in, the, um, in, the tr in enforcing the trust. They're able to actually cooperate. And a lot of that depends, of course, on culture. So we spoke about complexity, and complexity and the, our ability to build complex things is, among others, driven by our ability to communicate and communicate in the deep sense of the word, not exchange information, but exchange world models. And the, the, um, that communication, of course, is supported by trust, and trust is supported by culture. So we have to ask the obvious question of what is culture? I don't know what culture is, but I'm going to bring some examples, and maybe through that we will be able to get a clear picture of what culture is. So culture is our sum of beliefs and traditions and rituals and stories and vocabulary and ways of talking and way of engagement. A very important aspect of culture is the taboo, the things we don't talk about. People that are new into a culture, that is where they often fail. They, 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 they violate a taboo because nobody ever told them that you're not supposed to say that thing in a particular context. You have to learn it, and you learn it, sometimes the uh, experience is quite painful, but you learn everything about how to act in different situations. So that is culture. Now, we talk about corporate culture and about country culture. They're, they're very tightly related. We'll get to that maybe in, in a minute. So how do you create a culture? And create a culture is a bit of an ambitious word because you don't really create a culture. The culture creates itself. But maybe you can talk about how was a culture created without talking about how I or how somebody can create a culture. If you create a culture, it very often will not work and the, the unintended consequences will be very great. You might end up you could, you could try to create a culture of collaboration and trust and you'll end up with the tyranny uh, just because the enforcing the culture might be very, very bad for you. You can't, you really, really can't enforce a, uh, a culture. You, you, could, you could enforce behaviors and that usually doesn't pay or there's, there's costs associated with that. So how do you create a culture? You, first of all, if you have a shared environment, if you live in the same country or in the modern age, maybe if you live in the same virtual world or if you work for the same company, that in some sense allows you to create a culture. And most of us, many of us, belong to different cultures, especially in the modern age. That means I have the circle of my geographical proximity, but then I have my corporate proximity or my other communities. Maybe I belong to a gaming community. Maybe I belong to some other uh, discussion community. And each one has their own stories, rituals, habits that create their culture. Experience creates culture. 
two people or a group of people that have actually experienced something together and have a story to tell. And the story might span many years or many millennia, but it's something that we went through together. We feel connected. When the, a child's very first sentence is often, daddy or mommy, tell me a story. And the reason they, and it's a wonderful magical moment when your child asks you to tell them a story. And the reason they want to hear a story is not because they need the information in the story. They probably heard that story a thousand times. The reason they want this story is because they want to experience something together with you. And by watching a movie together or reading a book together or taking a walk together, we experience something together. That's a wonderful thing and it helps us create culture. We refer to our shared memory. Stories create culture. Stories create culture. Language creates culture. Language is not only a communication and, synchron and synchronization media. Language is also a cultural thing. If you've ever met anybody that speaks Klingon, they're not speaking it in order to uh, coordinate, in order to synchronize. They speak Klingon in order to identify themselves culturally. That is, doesn't need any, any elaboration. Rituals, trust. Trust, create. Anybody here speak Klingon? Okay. Um, and uh, rituals. Now, sometimes in the corporate environment, we don't use these words, but we use similar words that mean the same thing. So in a corporate environment, we might not say rituals. Ritual is something a little archaic. Some, so we'll say something like process. Process means that if you want to get something done, you have to do it this way and that way and the other way and the other way. Why? Because that's how it's done. And we, 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 wouldn't, say the, we wouldn't use the word ritual because ritual sounds a little, a little you know, magical out there. It's uh, something that, that belongs to the old age. But we, we're, we're modern. We do process. But if you think about it and dig deep into it, very often the process is just another word for ritual. It's a thing that you do not because it serves any purpose, but you want to feed the bureaucratic monster or whatever it is. And by the way, feed the bureaucratic monster is a metaphor and it's a ritual and it's a story that we tell ourselves. It's a great metaphor, by the way. Uh, so that is the, um, the purpose of rituals or even stories. We don't tell stories. We have corporate strategy. We have corporate mission. We have corporate vision. We want to be the best IT company in the world and bring high speed something to everybody in the secure, fast, cheap, reliable, modular, expandable way. So that's really a story that's titled as corporate mission, corporate vision, and that's, that's fine, but that joins us together. I want to talk quickly about mischief. Children learn a lot about trust through breaking the rules. And the reason that is, is because when children break the rules, when children do what they're supposed to do, allow the word supposed to for, 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 for sake of argument. When children do what they're supposed to do, their parents will guide them. Their parents will tell them, the parents will help them. But when children are being um, mischief or they're being uh, subversive, then they're discovering a world on their own and they're learning how to do it without any parental support. So the first time your child lies to you, you you're going to be very upset and you're going to say, why isn't he telling the truth? Didn't I raise him to tell the truth? But if you think about it, just another moment. He's learning theory of mind. He's developing his emotional intelligence. Once he knows how to lie, he's going to learn how to recognize deceit in others. And as long as he doesn't become a psychopath, this is how he is going to learn how to develop trust in others, earn trust in them. He's going to lie one day, and then he's going to break somebody's heart or lose somebody's trust or get fired, and then he'll learn not to lie so much. But it's a thing that you have to evolve and you have to experiment. And as children are doing mischief, they uh, uh, develop highly communicative abilities and they invent words and they discover how to talk to each other. And if you, this is a funny YouTube and you hear them generating language as they're pushing each other on and off the bed. And part of culture has to do, of course, with doing things together. We find deep satisfaction in doing things together. That is why we do things like dance or clap or sing or do all the highly synchronous activities is because we find deep satisfaction in doing things together. And among the things we do together is we, we like laughing together. Laughing is a social activity. Laughing is a way of letting loose of boundaries. And uh, we find the same things funny. Jokes are highly cultural. Timing is highly cultural. You could, tell, you could tell one joke in one culture and it'll be really, really funny. You could tell a joke in another country, culture and it'd either be dead in the good case, in the, in the fortunate case, or it could be really offensive in the, less, in the less fortunate case. We laugh together. That is what gives us our, um, our sense of, of culture. And one of the things about culture is that cultures, most cultures, 
in addition, I'm sure many of you get the reference here, of course. Um, many, there, it said uh, Jesus is standing in front of the, uh, in front of the, I think it's Jesus, stands in front of the large audience, and he says, we are all, you, we are all individuals. And everybody in unison says, we are all individuals. And then one person says, I'm not. So that is a, a story about individualism. And within the culture, we want everybody to belong to the culture. I want to belong to the culture. I want ev- to believe what everybody believes. I want to be part of you. I want you to welcome me as a member of your group. But I also want to think my own thoughts. I want to be free to express my own ideas, my own rationality, my own, um, my own way of looking at the world. And trust in a culture is built when I feel part of the group. We could laugh together. We could joke together. We share some of the same values. And on the other hand, I'm free to express other values or dissenting opinion. And anybody that's trying to, to, to uh, identify positive aspects of the culture has to nurture those two forces. On the one hand, people want to belong. They want to feel together. They want to feel like we share some values. Maybe we'll talk a bit about what values we share, but I also want to have my uh, individuality. I want to be able to think thoughts that are that go contrary to the group. I want to think other thoughts, and I want to be respected for that, or I want to be argued with, or I want to be negotiated with when I think things that the culture doesn't think. And if I'm able to create a group or belong to a group that on the one hand welcomes me as a member of the group, and on the other hand treats me as an individual and allows me to express offensive, dissenting, controversial ideas or thought, I will really, really feel at home. I will feel like this is a culture where I want to be. This is a culture where I have trust. I have trust to be part of the group. I have trust to express my own opinion. And it's a very, very difficult balance to achieve. If you achieve it, that is wonderful. I'm going to talk very briefly about an article by, um, uh, by uh, Marjorie Gilbert. And she talks about why we do things together. If we're going on a walk, I say, let's go on a walk together. And then as on the walk together, you're playing with your phone or talking on your phone or doing something else, I will be upset. And I will say, but didn't we say we're going on a walk together? And together means together. So if I'm going to a movie and the person I went to a movie with is otherwise distracted or engaged, I will feel violated because we do it together. And you, human beings find pleasure and fulfillment and fun and trust in doing things together. If we do something together and we do it, no matter what it is, we trust. And so part of building trust, part of building trust is actually doing things together as an objective, not because they allow you to accomplish something, but they allow you to build trust. And that is the vast, the the, the significant importance of all these games that we play or all these activities that we do. We do them together. They build trust. They allow us to cooperate. They are they are golden for the, uh, for the culture building. And of course, food. One of the best ways of building trust is to feed somebody else. You pay for the meal or you give them food or you share your berries. I trust you. I know that you're going to eat my, because there's, there's no other reason why I would share my food with you. I need the food for myself. But once you share food, we could then eat together and we could build our trust. So that's a quick comment about the importance of food, the importance of eating together. You should never, ever have a corporate activity that doesn't have food, lots of food. And, um, um, and alcohol, we talked about that last night. Alcohol also uh, <laughs> serves for uh, building trust. Thank you. Now, of course, culture is the, is the evolution's accelerator because culture allows us, as we said, to create a shared identity. And it's the shared identity that we can then trust each other. And if we trust each other, we are then able to cooperate and do things together. And cooperation will depends on language and enables language. And once we could do that, then the culture accelerates. And we operate not as an individual mind or brain, but we are now 50 minds or brains. And 50 minds or brains that are working in synchronization, in coordination, in a shared sense of timing, do something, do amazing, amazing things. A quick comment about scale. There are numbers. So we have the individual. When it's the individual, we can't talk about culture. An individual doesn't have culture. A culture of one one person is not much of a culture. Then we have the global scale. Everybody in the world. There are maybe global ideas, but we don't call them culture. Culture is somewhere in the middle. Culture hits on the scale maybe of a country, maybe of a subculture within a country. And it's important to realize that as you grow and grow, so if a company grows from 50 people to 100,000 people, the corporate culture might not exist anymore. It might be reduced to a set of, of sayings, a set of 
things, of ideas, but it's no longer a culture. Culture has its, its limitations and it's pretty small. So we could talk about the Chinese culture and a billion, 200 million people share a culture, but there are also many, many subcultures within China and you do not, we no longer can talk effectively about how to engage with the, with the Chinese culture. There might not be the Chinese culture. Okay, and now we are going to talk all about software development. I actually negotiated with the next speaker that I'm going to take another two or three minutes of his time, and I think I'm going to uh, cash in on that, uh, on that offer, so thank you. So we're going to talk about software development, because that's why we're here today. So any non-trivial non software requires co cooperation and communication. We cannot build software alone. We simply cannot. We need teams, and these teams have to be cooperative and communicative, and they have to trust. Teams that do not have trust will not be able to do anything beyond the trivial. That's why when you build a, a organization or teams, you have to be aware of trust, and culture is what enables that trust to be. I'm going to skip the next example because I want to leave some time for questions and answers, and I have more important things to go through, and I want to talk about some universals. These are universals that I think are common to all cultures, and without being judgmental, I would even like to say they should be common to all cultures, even if they're not. So, I think that we, most cultures would agree that we can accomplish more by cooperation than by working alone. What exactly the word more means, I don't know, but there is value into cooperation. I think this is a universal thing. It's almost as universal as laughing or storytelling or wearing clothes. Well, wearing clothes might not be universal, but um, as, uh, as, as storytelling or as child rearing. Uh, cooperation depends on communication and trust. I do not know cultures that, there are cultures that believe that cooperation depends on fear, but they usually do not last for, for very long. Ideas can be communicated with words. That's a global uh, thought. With the correct choice of words and with solid trust, we could end up with a shared model. So I have an idea, if we talk and if we trust each other, we could actually have a shared idea. And instead of saying my idea, I am capable of saying our idea. That might be a universal. And there is a universal that says we can know something about the world by observation. I didn't say that we could know everything about the world by observation. There are cultures that believe that some parts of the world we know by intuition or by authority or by reputation or whatever it is, but at least something about the world can be learned with um, observation. So those are what I might call universals. Ideas that would differ from culture to culture. So you might have a culture that says, and you could each find yourself here somewhere along this spectrum. It is more important that a model be correct than that it be shared. There is value in a correct model. There are cultures like that. There are other cultures say that it is more important that a model be shared than it be correct. A shared understanding is more valuable to us than a correct understanding. A shared understanding might actually be workable. A correct understanding that we don't agree on might not be workable. There are cultures that believe that words get their meaning from their definition. The source of authority on the meaning of a word is how the dictionary defines it. There are other cultures that say that words get their meaning from their use. How people use the word, that's what gives it its meaning. There are some cultures that believe that there is more than one way of being right, and other cultures might believe that there's only one way of being right, typically my way, but there, the cultures might differ on somewhere along that uh, spectrum. Many cultures believe that other human beings are capable of thought and are capable of emotion. And I think today this has already become universal, but it wasn't always universal. We used to live where in, in a world that the, the being, my culture was the, was the dominant culture, was the culture capable of deep thought and emotion. The other people, they're, they're not. Um, it, it, we, evolution, evolution wise, maybe we had to go through that phase, I don't know. Um, we believe that ideas can be evaluated based on merit. There are cultures that believe that ideas get value from who said them or who thought them, hierarchical cultures. What happened is what should have happened. These are somewhat like fatalistic cultures. And there are cultures that believe that we could learn everything from the world by observation. I am going to skip the next two slides, even though they're very important, because I want to give some time for comments. I want to talk about diversity. Diversity allows us 
to think out of the box. Within one culture, within one framework, we sometimes find ourselves within a very, very tight echo chamber and we all end up echoing and thinking the same thoughts and thinking the same way and it is hard in a non-diverse world, in a monoculture world, to think thoughts. So as new people come into the culture and they're integrated into the culture, we will find that again, we think the same things. And that's why it's always important to bring people that are diverse. And the most valuable thing about diversity is diversity of experience, diversity of thought, diversity of perspective. And we want those people here, and if they ever drink the Kool-Aid and become part of the dominant culture, we need more diversity once again. It, it's an ongoing process. We need to have the diversity because that is what allows us to, to um, think out of the box. Now, you have to be careful with diversity because if you have and if you have no diversity, then we all think the same thing. If we have infinite diversity, then we might not even be able to talk to each other because we don't have any shared platform, we don't have any shared trust, we're not capable of doing anything together. So we need to have enough commonality where there is some glue that binds us as a people and enough diversity that actually allows us to think other thoughts and, and that balance is a very, very difficult balance in many societies and many companies are struggling with the balance between how do I preserve our unique identity and how do I bring the gifts and rewards that diversity has to offer. I don't have a, um, a full uh, solution to that. I'm going to talk about the importance of, I'm going to talk about a few applications and then we'll take some questions. You should be aware of the world model and the language of the person that you are communicating with. Unless you have worked together for a long, long, long time, chances are that you and I have different perspectives. It's worthwhile exploring that so that we could communicate better. And that builds trust and over time it'll become easier and more natural. You should try to converge on a common world model and language. Never say, well, when I say this, I really mean that. That's not a useful statement to me. We have to talk the same language together. That goes back to the comment about cognitive overload. If we have to constantly translate things from model to model, we're not, we're not being effective. Be cultural aware. Part of being cultural aware is the points that are assumed but that are not explicitly stated. We have a lot of assumptions. We can't state all the assumptions. We don't know them. But be aware, if somebody says something culturally clumsy, they might not have a low EQ. They might not be stupid. They might just not be aware of some assumed knowledge that you have because you've been in the culture so long. Be kind, be generous, be aware, and, and try to find the shared, the, shared, the shared model. You should try to give terms formal meetings, it helps, and start using them, but don't be too stuck on the formality. And once the term has been accepted, do not change terms quickly. There's a very, very large cost to changing terms, but allow the terms to evolve over time. It will become more expensive to change words, but culture will continue to evolve, so you might find that the same word has, has new meanings. And it's very, very important to have fun. It's, it's really, really important to have fun, fun. First of all, it's fun to have fun. And as Dr. Seuss says, right, look at me, look at me now. It's fun to have fun, but you have to know how. And how do you have fun? You just discover it. You just play, you just explore. Children are very good at this. Everyone should allow their inner child to have fun. Having fun together is one of the best trust builders uh, there is, and I want to give like another three minutes for a question or two. That's really all I have to say today. Thank you very much.